Good evening, hello and welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. I'm Fabio Gigi, I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS. And our speaker tonight is an old favorite and a student uh, of SOAS back in the day. He did his MA in Japanese studies um, here with us. Then, sorry? BA Japanese. BA, sorry, yes. BA Japanese and studies. Korean. And Korean. Was BA. With BA, yes. And then you went on masters. to do the masters. And then an MRES at UCL next door. <laughs> and then, so sort of moving up the ladder um, from SOAS to UCL and then got a place at the Nissan Institute in Oxford with Dr. Roger, Professor Dr. Roger Goodman um, to study what became the topic of his talk today. But I'm also very happy to say that actually uh, the work that he's done at for the MA here uh, in Japanese studies um, is also now out. It just appeared in uh, the Japan Forum which I'm sure you all know. This is the journal that is edited by the British Association of Japanese Studies that is based alternately here at SOAS and at the UEA. And the paper is called uh, Minoritizing Identities. And it has a great subtitle, which is right, to, I, I prepared to read it out to you. Um, Imposing Racial and Cultural Illusions of the Japanese. And so that was based, it's a very good example of how to build your career. Uh, Dr. Akira Shah is currently a postdoctoral um, research associate here at SOAS and also postdoctoral affiliate at the University of Oxford. And his uh, talk tonight is entitled De Whitening Global Education in Japan Silent Dilemmas with the International Baccalaureate. Thank you very much. And over to you. Thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you everyone for being here today, um, everyone in person and online. Um, it is a pleasure. Um, I'm really humbled to be able to finally present an aspect of my research that originally came from my, my doctorate degree, um, some four years of work and now still ongoing. Um, and um, look forward to, see, to hearing of all of your interesting questions and feedback at the end. Um, now, before I carry on with this talk, you probably, perhaps, the most eye-catching part of the title is this phrase of de-whitening. Um, so before I begin this, I want to... Ah, uh, Fabio, how do I make the next slide? Sorry. Uh, well, we need a degree in engineering to... <laughs> well, the engineering is that long? Okay. It should I'll check, please. Okay, I'll just use that. All right, that'll work. So this talk that I'm giving here today is actually based on a journal article, which I was hoping would be out by the time of this talk, but sadly, it'll probably be out in a week. So please keep an eye for it on it. It is the first major publication that takes a look at some of my findings from my doctorates, which I've based this talk around. So a lot of this talk is really a, a dissemination, really, of this paper. So for all the references that I make here and all of my original data that I use in this talk, all of it is actually referred to in this paper. So if you want to know more and you want to have more, um, a thorough, more thorough understanding of all aspects of this talk, I will hope refer you to this paper, which will be online in a week. And you, I will make sure that there is all, all channels will be available so that you can find it. It is open access, so it should be easy to find. So the theoretical framework that I'm working here, that I'm using here is called whiteness. Whiteness here is defined in, by a, um, a renowned anthropologist who works with this concept quite in, in a lot of detail, considers it a term which refers to the cultural web of assumptions of normality and invisibility that maintains social privileges, power, and hierarchies typically associated with white skin. But before I go further with what this theoretical framework is about, I think it's important to understand the position of which I approach this research from and where this theory came from because I did not go into my doctorate thinking that this is what I was going to look at and this is what I was going to apply to the research I undertook. So as we commonly do, especially within disciplines like anthropology, we like to have a lot of talk about our positionality to give us an understanding of my position as a researcher in relationship to the work that I've been undertaking. Now there's a lot more detail of this like all other aspects in the paper, 
But the most important things to keep in mind for now is, first of all, the other, for, the other ma ma major aspect of this paper is about the International Baccalaureate, the IB. And I have quite a, lot of, quite a long history with the IB. First of all, it was all based in the UK, but I undertook its entire continuum of programs as a child. Everything from the primary years program, which is elementary school, to the middle years program, which is like the GCSEs, and the diploma program, which is like the A-levels in the UK. And then I finished and I said, I don't want to hear about IB ever, ever again. But then after I finished my bachelor's, I found myself working um, as a teaching assistant and a cultural integration counselor at an IB school. Um, and so I did for a brief time find out what it was like working in an IB school as well. But this was meant to be a brief stint. And I left and I said never again. But here we are now. So the International Baccalaureate is renowned mostly for its host of schooling programs. These and one of these are probably the ones, if anyone knows of the IB, these will be where you, are, you probably know it from, especially the blue one called the diploma program, which is the one that people take from high school. And it usually is the one that propels them into um, universities. Now, I want to show of hands briefly, because I'm almost certain that there's at least maybe one of you in this room, maybe, who potentially has some form of history with IB. So for anyone who took uh, any of these IB programs, could I have a raise of hands briefly? Oh, there's one. Was it diploma program? Did you take any of the others? Okay, so that's very common, common to find. So it is most famous for this diploma program in particular, right? This is the one that is IB's moneymaker. And there's a lot more in which we could talk about this, lots to go into. Uh, we could talk about the fact that at the heart of this program is this concept at the very end called international mindedness. We could talk about the fact that in the middle of that circle, there is this whole idea of creating the international moral character, right? And there's a set prescribed set of values to what this international person should be. We're not going to be talking about these aspects today, though, but I want you to keep in mind that IB is much more than just its curricula. It is also trying to give a moral take on what an international person is and how they should be educated. Now, just to give a bit of a flavor of the, uh, ex uh, the, um, the impact that IB has in the world today, there's currently over 8,000 programs at 5,900 schools in 160 territories. This is quite a significant figures when it comes to territories in particular. There is no other program for, that registers education that's independent of a national government that has so much breadth of influence in the world. However, the big asterisk to this is how much influence it has in its depth, how much in numbers in different countries around the world. This varies quite dramatically. So the Americas that IB register at, which consider is, is North and South America is down as 45%, but about 40% of that is the US, right? So this gives you an idea of where in some, which markets the IB tends to be popular over others. The uh, middle one, Africa, Europe, Middle East, has been increasing a lot recently, thanks to the Middle East, where it has been growing quite heavily of recent. And the other growth area has been the Asia Pacific. And one of the major reasons for that has been Japan, which we will get to. Now, the methodology for this work. So I undertook the very, mo the very common method that all, almost all anthropologists tend to employ, which is ethnography. Ethnography is... A very an easy thing to say that often can mean a lot of different things. So I do want to sort of zoom in a little bit more on exactly what type of ethnographic work I undertook. So in my form of ethnography, I took participant observation, which is usually the heart of all ethnography. I also took a bunch of 44 uh, semi-structured interviews, um, which were mediated in either Japanese, English, or as I like to also say, Japanglish. Um, and I also took a lot of structured surveys, around 100 or so for the purposes of the work I did. My participant observation was over one year, and the nature of that I will discuss as we move on. But the question I had when I entered the doctorate, which is where this original project came from, the overarching project, was this. Why, after decades of indifference and official recognition in 1979, was the Japanese education system now taking notable interest in IB, and how are Japanese schools currently negotiating with its existence in everyday life? 
Beyond this question, though, I didn't really have any hypotheses or any major approach, sort of prediction as to what I was going to find in the field. For I was employing what we commonly refer to as a grounded theory approach, where I wanted to find my gain, collect my data first, and then through analyze the data later in order to analyze different themes, what we will commonly call thematic interpretive analysis. So with this, uh, now for some background on the topic itself. So as you might have thought with the question that I had when I was undertaking this project, I was trying to see if I could do a participant observation of an IB school in Japan. So I can get an idea of how everyday life is for people negotiating with this program in a Japanese context. So why Japan? In 2013, the Japanese Ministry of Education and the International Baccalaureate Organization, the IBO, established a promotional consortium. There was a lot of um, interest from elite politicians at the time. Um, Prime Minister Abe was involved in wanting IB promoted quite directly, and the Ministry of Education sort of followed the cabinet in wanting to promote this. So they created what is quite a rare arrangement for the IB, which is a relationship directly with the national government, which is not something that, that is common for the IB even today, although that is starting to change because of the success in Japan, I might argue. As of tw November 25th, so this Monday, there are 116 IB schools in Japan um, from what was 16 in 2013. And when I started my project in 2019, I think the number had gone up to around the early 40s. So it did seem like it was a jump at the time, but we, I didn't know that when I was undertaking my research, it would happen to be what has really been the peak of growth of IB schools in Japan. So currently we have around 70 DP, 61 DP, 39 MYP programs. But what really has spurred the growth is this dual language diploma program, which is personally speaking, um, not perhaps the most accurate name for what the program actually is. It is more like a 85 to 90% Japanese di taught diploma program with about 10% of English involved. Um, in Japanese, we do call it the Nihongo DP, but it is, Jap it is uh, about 90% Japanese, 10% English mediated. The Ministry of Education directly helped fund this, gave this funding to help support the IB to create this program, which is another reason why it's contributed to growth in the country. Now, before IB, there was a very famous international education initiative in IB called the Super Global High School, the SGH. The initiative has now ended, but one thing that was quite interesting is looking at its total numbers, which at, the, at its most had 123. IB is getting close to that now. I think it's safe to say that it will overtake it. However, there is a lot of asterisks and a lot of nuance into the types of schools that IB operate in versus the ones that SGH used to operate in and so on. This is not details I'm gonna go through in this talk, but it is worth highlighting that it's more than just simply the numbers. There are types of schools where, you know, students perhaps have more uh, ease, ease of access versus others which are more elite and harder to get into due to tuition fees and so on. Right, so off I go to a school in Japan to do my field work. This was the school, but I was meant to do my field work at, but I had one big problem. I was meant to start this field work in April, 2020. And that was probably the worst time to start any form of field work <laughs> in the world at the time. And so because of this lovely thing, I had to actually completely change my approach. I had my work visa ready. I was going to go, I was about to get on, I had a week to get on my plane and it had all been canceled and called off. I had to go back, rewrite my paper, my ethics procedures and rattle them in my head and ask myself, is there a way I can research IB without researching schools in Japan, is that even possible? So while I was looking at this, I found out that there was a way. And so what happened was I moved from schools and took a gamble and I went to universities because I found out that there is this very interesting IB initiative happening at universities right now. It's called the International Baccalaureate Educator Certificate, what they call IBEC. This is a public directory they have pub uh, that they have every year out to show you which universities in the world run it. What was interesting is seeing just how many Japanese universities run it. In fact, only the US has more. And that was true of when I was undertaking my research in 2019 as well. So 
I also found out that most of these IBEC programs were being run inside larger degree programs at these universities. So I thought to myself, okay, teacher education seems to be expanding in Japan too. Maybe this is a way to still look at the expansion of IB in Japan but from a lens I hadn't expected. And perhaps the universities will adapt better than schools to the pandemic. Well, they did and it worked, but not in the way I had imagined. So I was meant to start my field work in September, 2020 because we all thought COVID would be done by then, of course. But then, then came a, a really difficult wave, particularly in the UK, which threw a spanner into, that, into the works of that as well. And so instead, what happened was, uh, my fortune came from the fact that the Japanese university I was meant to do my primary research at decided miraculously to run the entire program online, which was quite unprecedented for the Japanese higher education system at the time. And they weren't the only ones to make that decision of the ones that run this program. But there was a catch, of course. I couldn't physically go to Japan. So my year of ethnography was a nocturnal and digital one. So this is my dorm in Oxford. I'd look at the moon, right, get ready to start fieldwork. I would start fieldwork at 1 a.m. and I'd finish at 10 a.m. for a year. I thought that this would end maybe at some point because COVID would end, maybe half the year would be in person, but it never happened. But to my fortune, it, the universities happened to stay online for that full year and only switched to in-person the moment I finished my fieldwork phase. So I luckily got everything I needed. And part of the reason for that was because I was also able to get some physical, any of the physical aspects I needed, physical documents that I needed to help co-facilitate and participate on the course that I was studying for my participant observation. I was actually getting very generously from my universities in Japan. All my physical documents are coming by the post. So I had everything I needed for that. And everything else, the digital socials, the staff room meetings, everything was online. And part of the reason for that is that the student cohort at this university, while all Japanese nationals um, were from all different parts of Japan. And because of regional lockdowns, many of them couldn't be physically at the university either. So my everyday kind of looked a bit like this. Uh, this is a bit of a rare example of a hybrid class. Most of them were not. We eventually went to a fully online scenario and that became the, the main um, for my period of work. So I have a paper on this separately if people want to understand more about the journey I went through to do that work. There's a lot of interesting methodological reflections to have been made, I think, from that period. So please take a look at that if interested. Now, before I start with the dissemination of this particular aspect of research that I'm talking about today that came from that year of field work, I want us to pay attention to one aspect of the IB, IBEC directory that I, re, I just put up, particularly looking at the mediated languages that they formally list in as being taught, as how, and as the language of mediation they used to teach their IBEC. There's a couple of very striking factors to see here, perhaps most of all, to see that only all these uh, countries I've listed here, by the way, are all the countries that run IBEC that are from the non-anglospheric world. So no UK here, no Australia, no US, and no Canada. This would be an asterisk to Canada. There is one that does English and French bilingual, so you could put them there and they would come up in orange. But if you take them away, we have all the non-anglospheric countries represented here, and Japan is the only one that mediates mostly in Japanese exclusively. And I can also say from experience that the other ones that have it in orange or the one that even says it's in green actually isn't always necessarily fully English uh, either. There's often quite a lot of Japanese to those components and different aspects. The other significant one of a uh, country of growth right now is Korea. Korea is now the second country to run a dual language diploma program in Korean, which has followed off the heels of the success in Japan. But look at everywhere else. There is no university that runs its program in its native language exclusively. The only one is Spain that has one. And that's miraculous when you think that the IBO has three official languages, English, French, and Spanish. And yet they don't even have a fully exclusively taught French program for IBEC either. So this is quite a significant aspect to keep in mind of as we continue on what I will now move on to is this tale that I'm going to call the tale of linguistic whiteness. Now, 
This university is uh, not the main one I, I, I did my research at, but I did comparative research in a number of others. So I'm going to be giving this one the name of Rindo University. And at this university, I experienced an English taught module as part of its entire program, right? So specifically an English taught one with nine students. The student cohort representation was lower than usual because of COVID-19. And at the end of the, of the module, I interviewed all of the nine students. We had sort of a reflective discussion or experience of the program and all of his different aspects. So all of my data that has come has come from this that I'm about to now talk about. My first part of data though comes not from the interviews, but from one of the first classes we had on that module. It began with this very pr provocative line. Why should they get away with this? This was the voice of a student, Javeria, a student of South Asian ethnicity. Hilda, the lead facilitator of two, said, don't. What were they talking about? Hilda was having, had just finished giving a speech, a speech about the importance of English in academia, that English is the undisputed apex of today's linguistic hierarchy on earth, like it or not, and we don't have to like it, but you have to accept it. And that engaging with English and academia, therefore, would, of course, provide the greatest impact in the world. No arguments there. These are facts, right? Just to show you how factual she is on the money with this, I want to take a look at a visual representation here, which I think is fantastic. This is from looking at the major databases in academia, Scopus Web of Science, um, as examples, to show you the amounts of publications that are made in English versus all other languages. But what's extra scary about the blue, the blue, purple, and yellow circles, which show the big databases that, we're, that are, that are pop most popular, is these circles that are dotted. These are the ones that are unknown. We have no idea, actually, how much has been published and how much has been documented, because that's how bad our documentation of academic knowledge is in, of global publications in the world. Let's look at some more stark figures. So of, of um, World of Science Journal coverage says that 82% of all of its articles are in English. Scopus says 82% too. Ulrex says 73%. The second best player in all of this is less than 10%. That is the level that English has of dominance of, in the publication landscape in the world, the level of dominance English has in knowledge production in academia. This then, is Anglo-American imperialism. And what other linguistic linguists call, uh, have defined it in this, from a linguistic sense using it in this context is that from the Latin Imperium covering military and political control by a dominant power over subordinated peoples and territories. But this Anglo-American imperialism I'm going to tease in my aspect isn't just simply that, it is also something connected to a larger branch of a force, a cultural epistemic, uh, epistemic force that I call Anglo-American whiteness. Now, how did I? How did this uh, theme come from? Uh, so there was there was this talk that Hilda had given, and I didn't think much of it because the rest of the module we didn't seem to engage with that anymore. The students didn't seem in class to talk about that aspect much anymore. So it sort of seemed like that was that. But then came the interviews, and my first interview came with someone I'm going to call Ishida, and Ishida had this sort of moments where she wanted to sarcastically quote some of what Hilda had said back in that class we had had, and then give her, give her own answer to it, which was, who cares? It was exactly her words. And so I was, uh, so I was like, hey, can, you, can you explain? Like, what, what do you mean by this? So in, she sort of struggled. So instead, she wanted to give me a different example to try and explain why she felt uncomfortable with what had been said in that class. So she brought up this thing called the joint seminar, and this ended up becoming a really big theme with all but one of those nine students I interviewed. Everyone was talking about this joint seminar. So it became this theme that everyone was interested in. And it started with this initial uh, discussion. This is a sort of a transcript from part of our discussion we had with Ishida, which is where I first encountered this joint seminar. And she had said that um, this year, Bridget, who is a student part of Ishida's cohort as well, an American national, um, had said that in the joint seminar, English is strongly recommended for doing a presentation. And then you see people like myself and fellow students like Yanni Gihara, 
who is another fellow student of the cohort, a Japanese national. In Japanese, we, we write the thesis for the degree in Japanese. So if I do the presentation in English, it would be so shallow. So one thing that's quite interesting is that although the, this particular IBEC module was done in English, for the degree, the students are actually free to pick whether they want to conduct their research in Japanese or in English. And of the nine, of this group of nine, six were Japanese nationals, three were non-Japanese nationals, and all six ended up writing their theses in Japanese. So when it came to this joint seminar, they thought, which is a place where they want to present aspects of their research for critique so they can develop their ideas, they understandably thought that they should probably best do this in Japanese because that's what they're going to write the thesis in. But Bridget wasn't so happy about this. I want to give you a few quotes that we had in our interview. Bridget had a very different perspective. There are several of us that cannot speak Japanese, and it's a waste of our hour to read your English written handout, which, by the way, those who present in Japanese were had to make for those if you were to present in Japanese. But if you presented in English, you did not have to create a Japanese handout. Um, and then sit through your Japanese presentation and understand 10%. Whereas if you did it in English, I'd understand at least 50%. It's your right to present in Japanese. We are a multilingual community. I understand that. I appreciate that you create translation for your slides. But when you are purposely deciding not to speak English, you're saying to Hilda and to other people who don't speak Japanese, I don't care about your opinion. And that's really cutting yourself off in terms of the international English community. You know, it's cutting yourself off from having that global conversation. Now, what about the other two non-Japanese nationals? Javeria, the one that we had just mentioned from South Asia, also did side with Bridget in that she thought that the Japanese students should not be using Japanese in this module because it's officially written down to be taught in English. And so they should be doing this no matter what. But note the end of her line here, however broken that is, was a very interesting line she gave at the end of this opinion. She also felt bad for the Japanese people. They don't know English that well. It's not their fault. They have to do everything twice when they make the translations and the slides. And then the third one was also an American national, but of Mexican ethnicity, a native Spanish and English speaker. She had given me a whole, lo whole long tale of a story of how she had encountered all forms of discrimination by not being able to speak English properly as a child in uh, the West of the US, particularly with her uh, parents who could speak no English whatsoever. And so had this large empathy for people who struggled to learn English in general. So from this lens, she had said that when she joined this university in Japan to do this program, that she was signing up for a Japanese education at a Japanese university with a lot of Japanese court members that speak Japanese. And so she felt that as, as it is also allowed for them to speak Japanese in the course, that it should be tolerated and that she should be able to cater for them for that too. So it was a very interesting contrast of opinions of those three non-Japanese nationals, right? But what about the Japanese nationals? Ishida gave me one of my favorite lines. This is a graduate school, not an English language school, which technically is true, right, uh, for the program. But I thought the other two interesting opinions that sort of help epitomize the different opinions they had, one was about pragmatics, right? Because our true intentions don't get across with the work we're trying to communicate in English, we would rather convey what we want in Japanese and receive responses from people who understand that. The other main school was concerned linguistic identity. This idea that while Yanni Karo here was speaking about, again, self-quoting Hilda's speech about English's impact, while she thinks there is truth to that, can't you also say there is tremendous meaning to doing research in your own mother tongue? So, What I found when I, when I tried to analyze this whole situation was that we had two aspects occurring here. First, we had this unwitting edification of whiteness, in this case advanced by a facilitator and students of white Anglo-American ethnicities through the vehicle of English. And we have other researchers who have documented this pattern and trend in other sectors of Japanese society. We then also had explicit attempts at deconstructing this Anglicization via sentiments of linguistic egalitarianism, in this case by those of non-white ethnicities. And this case also illustrates that Japanese educa uh, higher education in the system is no, no exception to facing pressures of Anglicization, 
But as I think may, was made quite clear when you even look at the language mediation of the IBEC programs in the world, it also shows that Japan's language is still quite robust and very independent compared to numerous other post-colonial societies who refusing to engage in English, take examples like India or Pakistan, is not often a realistic option. And that the reality is still for the moment anyways, is that for the average Japanese national, the acquisition of English and extension life in the English speaking world is not the jackpot to social mobility, socioeconomic prosperity in the way that it continues to be for many others in lower resource territories in the world. Now, this critique about English as a part of a larger branch of this, of this understanding of cultural whiteness has been noted by many authors, uh, other authors before who've worked with this concept. It's not necessarily new. Um, but one aspect that I wanna move on to next is something that I think has not really been talked about much. So we're gonna move away from language and now to something else, pedagogy. So this other university, Asagi University, which is the one that I spent most of my time doing my field work at, is the place where I participated and co-facilitated parts of its full year of its IBEC program. And so at the end of that whole program, I took interviews with 34 students who were all involved with the full IBEC program. Uh, there were others who only took a single module of the program, in which case in that class, there was about almost a hundred students. But in this case, the inter I mainly ended up trying to understand the community of those that went the whole distance with the program. And all of these interviews were conducted in Japanese. I have a funny chart here that shows you their listing of how uh, their second language proficiencies. Um, even the two who put down advance did not want to speak English when we were interviewed. So the whole thing was mostly, was almost, in this case, it was, all the interviews were done in Japanese. But the tale that I want to introduce this aspect of whiteness with begins with a very popular app in Japan, Line. So I received this Line notification one night when doing my field work from a student called, I'm going to call Sato. And we had a lot of line group chats at the time because it's COVID-19 and we were doing a, trying to do a lot of things, not just on Teams and Zoom, where they were the more formal environments for learning. We also used line to do our, have our own arrangements and discussions too. So Sato said that he was struggling to understand something that we were studying in class. Um, and so he wanted to see if we could have this sort of emergency talk quickly. So three students said, yes, I, I, sorry, two, uh, three students said yes, and I said yes as well. So we all joined on the call. And it kind of looked like this. This is not the call, but it kind of looked like this. Uh, we're there, we're jotting down notes in the middle of Teams, and I've got my terrible notes to the right. Um, but he wanted to talk about this book, which we were using to study in our class, which is a Japanese translation to this book called Understanding by Design. It's a very influential textbook in IB at the moment uh, for IB educators. Anyone who teaches IB will know this very well because we use this concept of understanding by design, which is in this book has this idea called um, backwards design, right? Which in Japanese got translated to gyakumuki sekke, which is this idea that when you create uh, credits, when you're trying to create a, a plan for a lesson, the idea is that you want to create, make, instead of creating the final goal of being content, making sure that the students digest prescribed facts, which is very common in most national education systems in the world, including Japan, that the end goal is making sure that they learn how to learn, the process of learning. And this idea is trying to, is trying to get educators to create classes that make students ultimately focus on acquiring the process of learning as the most valuable skill to learn to acquire rather than the facts that come from the lesson itself. It's a very complicated thing to explain here and we don't need to know all about its details here today, but you do need to know a few aspects of it as I will get into why later. So advancing this one step further, in IB they don't just simply use this, they also have this idea of a concept-based curriculum as well, which they use by these authors, which is the idea that when you create a module, when you're creating, um, a lesson plan. You don't just do it as one individual teacher. You get the group of teachers together who are teaching the students across all the different subjects. You try and find a common concept, here quite specifically divine, defined by these authors. Take an example here like power or safety. And you try and 
create a, a course that has the students not only looking to acquire process-based skills, content-based skills, skill-based skills, but also metacognitive skills. So these developmental psychologists believe that metacognitive thinking is something that's also lacking in a lot of national education. And so they're trying to use this as a technique. Again, this has also turned out to be quite influential in Japan and we have translations for this too. Combining all this together though is quite difficult in practice and to design a lesson and actually execute it takes lots and lots of trial and error. So we have this whole space in the program to get these experienced or aspiring educators to learn how to use this technique. But in this particular moment I had with this discussion with this with Sato and the other and the other three, I found one peculiar trend, which was that not only was um, Sato some uh, the only one speaking at times, along with one other occasionally, but the other two were saying nothing at all, like complete silence, right? Nothing. We even had moments where we were on our on our Zoom screens, just almost staring at each other. It was very awkward, right? And I wanted to say that that was the first time I encountered it, but it's not true. I discovered that throughout my time co-facilitating parts and participating on this, whenever we had Zoom breakout sessions, particularly, we had all these moments where suddenly there'd be these instances of silence, like no one's talking. And I was like, I couldn't understand why. This was a very well-respected institution for what it does. These students are well, have very good grades. They're all quite intellectual. They come from very different types of backgrounds which I get into in some ways, but there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to pull off what was being asked of them in class. So why were they staying all silent? So the first thing to keep in mind when, I'm try when I tried to analyze why this was going on was the age demographic. This is quite significant. You do not often find spaces of education in Japan, with formal spaces anyways, with such a diverse age demographic. We had students who were in, as young as 20 and one who was as old as 55 because in this particular program, we have some who are experienced educators who have been working in schools for decades, who are coming here to get the IB certificate specifically. And then we've got others who have come straight from an undergraduate degree, aspiring to be educators. So from completely different perspectives, right? And in the system of this particular university, we put them into two brackets. Gakusotsu inse, straight master's students. Genshoku inse, in practice students. Usually the distinction is the one at the bottom has about five years or more of teaching experience. Anyone else gets put into the, the other category, though there are exceptions. But needless to say, you had these categories at work and they were significant. They weren't just ones that sort of informed how a particular module you were taking your degree was assessed. And sometimes they had different criteria for each group. But also, especially in these online environments, you even had these labels listed next to the students' names. So it was like we always knew who was the gakusotsu, who was the genshoku, we always knew, right? It was very clear, right? So then in the interviews, one thing I found that came up I, was that there seemed to be some form of ambivalence to this setup of having these two categories. So one, one interesting um, opinion I think came from this student who I call Miyazaki, who said, obviously there is a gap of experience between straight masters and in-practice students. On one hand, there are times when I felt our opinions would clash. And sure enough, there, were, there was an element where I felt I had to kind of concede mine. But there's also good, many good points to having in-practice students with us too. It's not all bad. They provide us with lots of experience, genuine experience. Um, and they also give us a lot of supportive advice, how to advance our careers. So it was a very, I think Miyazaki's comment is very good because it gave me a good snapshot of showing how some students saw the positive and the negative aspects of, the of having this dynamic in the class. Now, I wanna give you on the other hand, a more extreme opinion by one of the in-practice students who I call Sato. He said, I've been thinking about this whole problem of silence in our breakout sessions recently. And there are times when the straight masters act in this way, you know, they're listening to me because I'm experienced. Um, but then I just think there are guys who are not thinking at all, right? And whatever the frictions were though, and the attempts that were being made by some to diffuse them, we had some in practice students who went the golden mile, where it was one who was in their late forties who not who usually was being called sensei by these students because she is a school teacher. 
but she was so adamant that because they're not meant to do this, they're trying to create this horizontal learning space. She went to them and said, do not call me sensei. Do not even call me by my last name. Call me by my first name. She was extreme, very extreme example, but it just showed you a counter strategy of trying to get the straight master students to participate more. Because what they were meant to be practicing was this, kosei shugi, which is the Japanese formal translation to a pedagogy known as constructivism. Constructivism has been written in the past as a radical approach to epistemology that treats all reality as subjective and all knowledge the result of procedural construction. There is the original school of constructivism that we know in academia, led by John Piaget in particular, called cognitive constructivism. And it was later significantly developed on by Lev Vygotsky, coming up with this idea of social constructivism. The main difference really being that social is trying to get the teachers and the students involved in co-producing knowledge, right, in a social setting in the classroom together. This is what the IB and a lot of educational bodies like the OECD as well in, uh, included in this, uh, consider the progressive pedagogy today that we should be learning. And it's, this is what they refer to as constructivism. There are many influential educationalists, sociologists, developmental psychologists involved in the original theorization of this theory. But do we want to hazard a guess about where most of them come from and where most of their backgrounds are from and where they probably ended up formulating their theories from? The IB currently have this uh, publicly downloadable document called the History of the IB. It's a very small document. It was made in 2017. And they will show you this as one of their slides, the key educationalists who influence their pedagogy today. You've got John Dewey, John Piaget, Jerome Bruner, who were just mentioned before on the other slide. Um, but you will start to know, one of the things you will start to get concerned by is that this is, first of all, this is a 2017 document, right? So we're, we're, we're being shown very old origins of IB, a, a pedagogy, a, a, a organization that was founded in 1968, but its pedagogy was developed far earlier than that, right? As being the foundation for what IB is still today. They also show you the founders of IB, but we don't need to go into too much details about them today. We wanna to focus on the educators, but can we see a reoccurring pattern of the types of backgrounds these individuals are coming from? And let's not stop there because unfortunately the history of the IB slides do stop there. What about these people who we've just mentioned? Currently these two books are really, are, are particularly influential to IB education and remain core. The one on concept-based curriculum is a much more recent development that came in the 2010s, but is now considered mainstream for how we learn um, in an IB approach, in an IB classroom. But again, the, if we look at who these authors are, in this case, there, have been, there has been perhaps one major progressive change. Uh, the concept-based curriculum is made mostly by women. So we've got a change of pedagogy being developed by women. Um, but then apart from that, in almost all of these cases, we're not even just looking at the similar backgrounds from a Euro-American perspective. We're actually looking here even more at an American perspective, which is where more of these theories are coming from today. And these developmental psychologists and so on have developed much of their work based primarily on these contexts and not on the context that they may be applied to, such as within a Japanese context. So how was this pedagogy to know then that of course in a Japanese learning environment, we are used to the fact that a Japanese identity generally places itself within a fluent but disciplined scale of intimacy and formality with others that there is a deep-seated approach to relationality that we practice from as early as childhood and how we organize our registers, how we talk to those who are more experienced than us or less so, who is our senpai or kohai in a schooling environment in particular, and how this, who is our sensei by extension, our teacher, right? And, and knowing that we should be speaking to individuals with certain codes of not just verbal language, but also body language in certain ways than with other people. Of course, the theoreticians who made up this theory would not have been able to consider such aspects. So the students at Asagi knew that if they were meant to practice constructivism as was taught in the IB, they would have to make sure that they organize themselves to organize their relationships between each other in a way that IB wanted it to be, which is not the way that they were all used to it being 
where some would prefer those who would consider their teacher or their sensei to be the one who gives more knowledge down and where the others do more listening. They wanted to, they had to level the playing field to make sure all of their opinions could be all said, regardless of how much knowledge or not knowledge they may have on a specific aspect. But whatever they did, and whatever the in-practice students in particular were trying to do to get the straight master students to also talk, it wasn't really working. And I think and it comes down to the dissonance between the relation, the way in which relationality is considered with this pedagogy of constructivism as it was originally theorized versus how it's trying to be practiced within a Japanese environment. So this then I analyze is a Euro-American imperialism, which is also a form of Euro-American whiteness as this branch based on the theoreticians who came up with the concept in the first place and the ones who continue to come up with the way in which it should be practiced in an IB learning environment today. As I've written as an abstract from my thesis, I, will, I write that whiteness has surfaced at Asagi by virtue of a pedagogy failing to accommodate Japanese modes of relationality, white Euro-American constructivism. That's originally conceptualized by white Euro-American theoreticians and chiefly informed by white Euro-American spaces. A pedagogy then unwittingly rendered humanly universal by transnationally impressionable bodies like the IBO or the OECD before being hurtled across numerous contexts that may or as Japan represents, may not encourage the same interpersonal approaches that it promotes. Indigenous pathways to knowledge production to be resultingly construed as backward looking versus a modern, naively white Euro-American education. The Robertson and Sorensen article here does go into more detail of the politics of constructivism in, other, in various contexts around the world and also critique it for having this way in which it effaces the pedagogical knowledge of other local communities in different environments because they're just being pushed to learn to use this approach that transnationally influential bodies want them to learn. Now I use this is one paragraph I have towards the end of my paper that is coming out next week. But the main aspect I want to focus on really here is this idea that the this what issue we have when it comes to epistemologies of whiteness is that one of the biggest problems is invisibility. And it's difficulty in, in being able to be identified. Do you see how much tracing we had to do just to even look at this idea of constructivism through this lens? English has been much well identified, it's been much better identified and is something that has become much more popular to talk about. But there are many other branches and artifacts that come into this larger force that build on historical imperial legacies and current neoliberalist market realities that continue to empower this force today in ways in which we all still can't really identify this, and hence why this concept of whiteness has been terribly still underdeveloped and underexplored and under critiqued from all angles. So I wanted to end this, now in the paper I end my talk to, about uh, sort of mentioning how can the IB maybe take steps to improve the situation. But as we are here at the JRC, I wanted to talk more about what can Japan do? So. I think that this, at this issue um, within uh, a Japanese context can be fit into a broader concern that other sociologists have talked about with education in Japan, this idea of catch-up modernity, um, which I also can consider in this context, I would ask if this might not also be considered a form of catch-up whiteness. The idea here is that from a central Japanese governmental perspective, much of the educational policy and many other sectors too, but we're focused on education here, has often been reactionary to what transnational bodies, the metrics of transnational bodies want them to do. If the OECD tells them they're bad at X metric or Y metric, the Japanese government puts in a policy to try and respond to it. But one large issue we've got with this pattern is that a lot of what the Japanese education system could bring is not often registered in the metrics at the OECD or at the UN or at UNESCO or at the IBO because these epistemologies of knowledge to education have not been created by those who run who are, who are, who are creating the metrics in these transnational bodies. Western knowledge of education within these geopolitical spheres has been preferenced. And so other territories have to constantly react to what they say is the standard. But what about the comparative excellence of social educational approaches that is common in Japanese education versus a Western system. To give you one example, 
has not some, been something where it has that has influenced these bodies at all. So we we are got this dynamic where the hierarchy has been biased in what is constituting international pedagogy. So what can we do to try and address this problem in the Japanese context? The probably the most difficult one is trying to deconstruct this increasingly top-down approach to international and global education policy in Japan by governmental and corporate elites, trying to empower more regional bodies, uh, boards of education in this case in Japan, and local educational bodies to help influence what national policy should be for education and not simply swallowing from national government what it should be. Finding pathways for locally sourced research to influence national policy and not just national policy, but of course the transnational organizations themselves, the IB, who despite their grand name of the International Baccalaureate are anything but a representative of international education in the world. Creating spaces inside these international education initiatives like IBEC, can we get, for example, within an IBEC initiative, a way to have a space for students to have a discussion and encourage discussion about what may or may not be working about current approaches to IB um, when we position it to their own local context and what ideas could be generated from that and maybe fed back to IB to help improve them. But perhaps above all is to warn these local parties about simply swallowing what has been prescribed from national and transnational bodies, empowering them to create, contribute their thinkings to create more faithful and therefore more faithfully grounded national and transnational standards, a bottom-up approach to developing international and global education. So I'm gonna end my talk there. Thank you everyone for listening. And I look forward to hearing all of your questions. Um, and I'll just add, so if anyone is interested to learn more about this, this work, do go to this paper that will come out soon. You, if you struggle for any reason to access it when it's out, just send me an email and I'm more than happy to send you a copy. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, right, we have quite a lot of educators in the room. Um, I think there will be an interesting uh, debate, but uh, let me uh, start you off with, I mean, I think the last sort of the recommendations that 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 was really um, very interesting and useful. But I going back to the uh, material that you presented. So I think that I mean there's there's several ways of reading that. So the moment somebody says, for example, I'm Japanese, therefore I want to do my presentation in Japanese, and there you know, and sort of you said, well, it's it's a it's a question of pragmatics because the justification given for that is that otherwise the intention is not communicable. Mm. Couldn't we also read that slightly more critically as a sort of a more of an ethno-nationalist argument almost, you know, because I'm Japanese, I have this very special language or, or relationship to the language and I can only express myself as such. I mean, it, I, I'm, mm. I'm sort of, I, it is you can read it as sort of a resistance to this uh, imperialism um, of the English language, but I think there's all there's there's something. It's not just a neutral mm. resistance, right? There's mm. also there you can also read it as a slightly more reactionary thing, sort of saying, well, yes, because I immediately I want to so, so what about the other ones? You know, oh, they should speak English because the English is their language. But you specifically had examples of people who, whose first language wasn't English or who sort of spoke, uh, grew up bilingually. I think things become much more complicated. And I wonder whether sort of ideas of language, you know, what language does and what it is, how natural it is to speak a second language, because that's, I'm sure, something that you've also encountered as a researcher who speaks Japanese and who's, who's, who's has to be situated in a particular relationship to the language. Mm. So, yes, I was wondering what, what, what you thought about these kind of, um, not objections, really, but yeah, no, uh, alternative ways. So there, there's there's two two key aspects, I think, to, to talk with, to respond to that. So I think the first the first is more of a, it's an agreement in that there, it is, it is not just simply a neutral response. I think that's, that is fair to say. Um, is there a form of linguistic nationalism going on within this particular group? I think quite possibly. Um, but 
so I think it is important to look at it to also analyze it from this lens as well. But it is important to, to take it within the context yeah. that, Jap you know, you will not have the scenario occurring the other way around. Right. Ever. You, you will not have um, this scenario happening in the UK where people are being forced to speak the other way around and right. trying and having this discussion about having to resist the global language of Japanese. That will never happen. Right. Right. So it is important to recognize the relative dominance that English has, not within a Japanese context, but in an overwhelmingly global academic stage. The other aspect of this, I think, is more to, to look more is more of an analysis of the local example I gave at, at Rindo, which is that, you know, this program openly allows its students to conduct its work in English or Japanese. It gives them the choice. Right. And one thing that was troubling in this particular scenario was while the choice was open and there was no uh, blocking Japanese students from making that choice if they wanted to present work in Japanese, no such thing happened. They were able to choose exactly what they wanted. It was the, it was the issue that those who saw those who picked Japanese considered their decisions to be narrow-minded. Mm. So it's not, so they have choice, but the ch if they make the wrong choice, it comes with the stigma attached, right? Whereas would not be the case the other way around. Right. So, how free is their choice in actuality? Well, but that's that's in a way that's the price of freedom. But as you said, because that, I think that's the but connecting you, point. You said at the beginning that so the international mindedness is sort of built as a sort of a ideological assumption into the program. So, in in that framework, it per makes sense. Yes, mm. if you don't do it, you really you know you don't belong to this international cosmopolitan. Um, and I think it's also important to add that, you know, the, the IB itself has historically never said that English equals international education. It's never done this. It's always championed what it called multilingualist approaches to education. If you take the diploma program, for example, you have to take an acquired language. It is compulsory. Right. But unfortunately, what is going on with the IB is while it does champion multilinguist ideology, it is seemingly reacting to the neoliberal market reality mm. that English needs to be preferenced. And even with its own recent documents on multilingual ideology, you can find evidence of them leaning towards a bias for English. Right. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yes, let's open up to the floor. I'm sure we get a lot of experiences. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just to give you a moment to think. And yes, you start as well. Sorry, I, because um, I, my question is related to the this uh, DLDP. Yes, the dual, the dual uh, language. Diploma program. So that because of that, students were allowed to present in two languages. Is that connected to that? Um, so not not directly, but but uh, but yes, there is a, there is absolutely a link there in that the idea by the. Uh, Ministry of Education's investment in making this dual language diploma program is to sell the idea that IB is not a program that has to be learned predominantly in English. It could be learned predominantly in Japanese, and you can still get the qualities of what an international education is meant to be. So from that aspect, it seems that M Ministry of Education very much supports the idea that you can learn and conduct international education through the Japanese language and not feel like it's less international. But then they could have made it any language of their choice rather than just English and Japanese, maybe. They could, uh, yeah, they could have, but I think in this case, they're limited to the, what, the language of the facilitators. So they, yeah, it's one of the two for what's available. So this very quickly, you, you encounter sort of a, a, a natural barrier, so to speak. Very so quickly, yes, yeah, so who is available right. to, to the uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. I thank you for the very interesting presentation. My question is very, very naive and basic. I'm interested, like, in the year you did your field work, attending the online course from 1 a.m. and 10 a.m., how did you integrate that with the rest of your life? You become nocturnal. I became nocturnal. Life cycle first. Um, so, yeah, I, so I did become a completely nocturnal life cycle person. So I would... Uh, have my breakfast at 9, 10 p.m. and get ready for the day, which was the night. I think one thing that helped, ironically, was the fact that the COVID pandemic was so bad in the UK. It wasn't like I was missing actually on that much to do outside. 
the RU local university didn't have much running on in its physical proximity, and we were being encouraged to stay indoors more anyways. So that ironically helped a little bit, but I would never say that I ever got 100% used to living life like that, no, and I was glad when it was over very much so. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, really? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for the people online, please feel, please feel free to feed your questions into, uh, into the chat function or the question function, um, and we'll come back to you. So... Thank you very much. I, I remember actually uh, Roger called me and said, I'm a bit worried. Is this, is, you know, is this the right, can we do ethnography like this? Is this, you know, should, can, can, can we do that? Is that, isn't that a, too big an ask, you know? And, and you know, one, one of the things that I was quite uh, an, sort of fortunate to have had the experience of, which I wouldn't, I didn't realize at the time and, uh, until later was that at UCL, I happened to have taken this course in digital anthropology. And so I had all of this knowledge about how you could do ethnography in an online environment, but I never thought I'd actually do it for my doctorates. But then all of this knowledge came back and it sort of helped me learn how much literature there is on digital ethnography and how there are ways of doing this approach. So I sort of tried to use that as a compass to organize how I did it. Thank you, yes. Any other questions, personal experience or? <laughs> I want to put you on the spot. <laughs> yes, please. I'm just wondering, because I think I'm, you're some of your students, I mean, you call students, I don't know, but, but I think I'm, they try to make a presentation in Japanese, but you know, they're a student of the uh, kind of internationalized, I mean, university or so, right? And am I, am I correct? Um, so in these two universities I brought up, they're a little bit different. So the main one I worked at, um, the overwhelming majority of those students had never left Japan before. Um, they were all Japanese educators or aspiring educators. Um, and most of them had not worked in international educational context before, all grounded in Japanese education, but wanting to learn how to get involved within implementing this interesting program um, in a Japanese context, within Japanese schools. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I think one, one aspect that came up in my interviews a lot with them was the, a lot of them, so for some of them, they didn't actually make the choice to take the program. Their boards of education made it for them. They wanted them, to, they paid for them to come to the university to take the IBEC certificate because then they'll go back to their prefecture and then they'll work for an IB school there that the board wants them to go to or, or move them around. For those who went of their own accord to study the course, I think a lot of them thought that having this credential, this qualification of this IB can help them with employment in general, not just IB, right? Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. Then, when people listen to the word international, saying you know we can speak fluently in English, so I'm just wondering why they are not making a presentation in English because then. They try to be international, so that's why I guess I want to ask you the question: Who is the uh, internationalist? Who wants to be internationalist? Yeah. So in this case, most of these teachers, um, unless they're an English language teacher, they don't speak English, and they they are trying to look at international, the idea of being international from an educator perspective, more broadly in this case, so not as language, but as a way of teaching, a way of learning a way of, and, and, to, and to use IB as an inspiration for this. There is also a pragmatic angle too, which is that the uh, Ministry of Education have recently rolled out their active learning uh, update to their guidelines. 
And they, one issue that the ministry is facing is that they've got these new guidelines, which is meant to emphasize process of learning over content, but they don't really have the methods or assessment uh, exper experience of making assessment to make it work. And so IB in some ways is being analyzed as a tool in which they've tried and done this. Perhaps this is a way we educators can learn how to implement what the Ministry of Education wants. Yes, anybody else? Once you come in on that, let's have a quick look online. Um, Nothing yet. So, okay, let, let me ask a follow-up question. So, second example. So, silence. I think anyone who has taught in Japan will remember that this is always a very awkward experience, right? It's the the, 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 the spiral of silence. Once it starts, once it takes hold, it's almost impossible to dislodge. The only thing you can do is you can talk yourself. And you sort of start panicking slightly because you realize if you stop talking, there just will be more silence. And then you sort of end up uh, filling all the space with lots of words. Um, and I wonder how, I mean, the, the, in the example, it's very specific, right? So you interpret it as uh, being about uh, 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 hierarchy uh, questions. There's somebody who is there who's an experienced teacher um, who, who has experience in the classroom, be very sort of awkward to talk over them or sort of saying, well, this is how you should do things. But I think there's many, many different reasons for uh, sciences uh, to emerge, right? And especially, actually, independent of Japan, like I remember the first year when we were teaching online, it was dreadful. All these breakout rooms, you would sort of switch from one breakout room to another and it's like 50% of the people would just sort of, you know, have this dead-eyed stare uh, at the camera and then people would start to switch off the camera at all then you were just in a sort of room of uh yes so what i mean what 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 is sort of the did people specific they, i mean you mentioned in this one quote yes people do specifically say well this is it was an issue you know we don't we didn't really want to to sort of to upend this hierarchy but were there other moments where silence really became um problematic so it the the reason it became such a theme for me to, to look at is that this did it was peppered throughout the entire academic year these mm -hmm. moments different breakout sessions at different points it didn't always happen but it was always occurring at different at regular intervals at certain points in different classes and there is absolutely various reasons why science occurs in a room and I don't mean to infer that this was the only reason that silence would have occurred in the context that I was looking at, but one regular pattern that emerged when I was looking at how this silence unfolded was that I know who is bracketed as the in-practice student and who is the right. straight masters. I know their relative experiences, um, as I also have all the survey data for that beforehand as well. So I know where they're coming from. And over time with them, of course, I know certain habits as well. It seemed that the pattern that was constantly emerging was the in-practice students were talking and the straight master students were not. Right. And it did come later in the interviews that, you know, Miyazaki was one of a number that said that, you know, he ended up looking at, at up to this in-practice students like they were senpai or sensei. Right. And so he just felt like his opinion, he shouldn't really give his opinion. Um, and so there was a lot of this tension that went on in the room. And some of the in-practice students were doing their damnedest to turn it around because they know that they were being told to be different, right. but they just couldn't, no matter what they were. Right. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, that, but that's a very, that's a very common problem. And I, I, I wonder, just, just because, because it's a, the reason for that is not, necessary. well, it is a question of the hierarchy, but as you said at the beginning, the Japanese education usually is staged in such a way that these things don't happen, right? So it's year one, yes. year two. There's a massive difference between year one and year two. If you're in the Bukatsu, you can mm. treat year one students like slaves. Yes. Nobody will say, I think there's a massive hierarchical difference. The further up you go, uh, you know, the, the bigger the distance. And so um, if you start mixing things together, uh, and it's a quite, you know, we occasionally have mature students um, here as well, and this is a trend that will increase. And it's sort of, it, it's a similar dynamic uh, if you have somebody in the classroom who says, yeah, I worked for a foreign office for 40 years. 
do talk to me about international mm. relations to you, 20 year old. Yeah. You know, nobody, nobody will dare to say anything. So I think this is this is an interesting, this is also a structural aspect. Well, I think as, as you said that, so that, you know, there is a strictly sequential approach mm. to traditional yeah. Japanese pedagogy. We don't have this skip a year up and down dynamic, especially in the schooling right. sector happening. And so it and so it that's in a way what makes this scenario quite interesting is I probably almost certainly would not have encountered this problem in the IB school classroom. So having this classroom in the teacher education setting sort of gave the opportunity to look at this right. as an issue right. um, because of that rare diversity. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Did they ever consider splitting the breakout rooms into those experience versus not experience? Or were you ever in a room where it was just one group and did they speak more? Most of the time, the aim for us running the course is to try and make sure that we mix them together. And that's how we're encouraged to try and do it. I think that probably would have been some cases where it was all one and the other, but in general, we're always trying to mix. Yeah, so, and so the, you then often would see a pattern emerge. And not always, you know, there was, an, there was some time, there was one straight master's student who probably talked more than all the other in practice ones, but you know, in general, right, as a general pattern. Uh, recently, I read uh, by a professor Chinese academic who was writing about the dominance of English language in academia, uh, exactly those things that you covered. Mm. But he was also talking about dominance of the Western style of communication. Mm. That the ability, the Western ability to deliver your opinion clearly and forcefully onto the listener is valued in Western uh, communication styles. Whereas in uh, Asian communication staff, the ability to listen is equally important and valuable. And I think the law word relational that you uh, mentioned at the beginning. Do you think that with this uh, sort of uh, linguistic and pedagogical imperialisms that you have, there is also one that is communication in general. And have you looked at that sort of, uh, at that aspect? And do you think that in general, uh, I think might not be successful in those in the Asian context. Ooh. Okay, so there's yeah, that's good. That there's two questions. So 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 the first one um, about communication. So when the Ministry of Education sponsored IB, the official narrative for why was that it wanted to cultivate so-called global jinzai, global human resource, right? And this, they've been using this strap line for a lot of developments in education and, and economic sectors for labor sectors for some time now. And if you look at the Japanese national policy at what this Grobori Jinzai is meant to be, you will find exactly some of the aspects you've just mentioned. Communication yoku, communication skill. But it's not just any communication, right? Hyogen yok, not just any type of hyogen or expression, right? looking particularly at Anglo-American standards, right, and this being the barometer for what is meant to be good communication or bad communication, a good expression, bad expression. So um, I think when we talk about pedagogy, I think you could insert this idea of communication within that frame as well. And so there absolutely is, uh, this, uh, this absolutely is an issue that fits within these, with, fits within these imperialisms. And as for your other question about, will this mean IB succeeds or not in Japan? I think that part of the reason, one significant aspect about IB comes back to my question I had when I guess I first started my doctorate is why, why does Japan care about IB now? Because if it cared about all of this before, you know, it had this whole idea of Koksai Kijun, international standards long ago in the 90s. and 80s. So why did they not care about IB then and why now? And I think that one of the overarching reasons is to do with something that uh, I think also this scholar, uh, uh, can I go back a slide, Fabio, uh, is it possible? Yes, technically. <laughs> if, if you... <laughs> technically, <laughs> almost anything is possible. Uh, uh, um, is that, or even uh, more? One more, one more. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, this scholar, uh, Karia Takihiko uh, Sensei, um, he has talked a lot about the sort of delayed but steady growth of neoliberalization of global education in Japan. And what makes IB so significant 
is that up until IB, most of its initiatives, the Super Global High School, you also had the Super Global University, you also had the Super English High School a long time ago, there was a lot of initiatives that were attempting to uh, create what the government thought was international education. Part of, now what I'm about to say is nothing more than a, uh, a predict, a sort of a guess at this moment. I can't really, an educated guess, which is that I think one reason why Super Global High School has been abandoned or schemes like this, and they've moved more to the IB to help is because running SGH was too expensive for the government. Mm. I think that Ministry of Education doesn't get as much money from the finance ministry as they used to, and there's a lot of ministerial politics going on. And that do, having IB run it means that more parents pay instead, the government pays less. It's also outsourced, so less Japanese resources, and they can still get this making glo global human resource done. But the penalty for that, of course, is that who can afford to go to an IB school? One aspect I haven't talked about in this talk, but would come up in future work, is the types of schools that run IB in Japan now. We, and when SGH was running, to give you a, a, a comparison, half of them were private Japanese schools, what we call Article One Ichijoko schools in Japan, and the other half were public schools. But IB has around the same number that SGH used to have, but now they've got almost half of that number is non-Article I international schools. Then within the other half, you've got more than two thirds being private Article Ones, and you've got a very small chunk being public Article I schools. Basically very few places that you can do IB for free or almost free. And most of those places where you can do it are coming from prefectural schools and very, very, to be fair, of, of a diverse variety of regions. We have a prefectural IB school in Totori Prefecture, for example, which is quite interesting and rare. But um, these are exceptions to the overwhelming trend that it, having international education is becoming more of a privileged problem. And that the type of international knowledge that we're preferencing for this education too is becoming more Anglo-American. Yes. Mm. Yes, I think that's... Yes. Uh, my um, nephew and niece, they went to Canadian school in Kobe. Kobe Canadian Academy. IB. Uh, I know uh, the one. Um, what about like American school in Tokyo? Do they do IB as well or they do different like American standards? Um, so that school, I know the school you were mentioning, that, that's a quite a, a, a particular school. It was one of the first to run IB of all of Japan in its history. So it's, it's quite a, a different kind of school. Most schools that run IB now, ever since we've had this big growth, um, that are international schools, so that first 50% of the number we have today, of that number that are international schools, you will find some that are coming from certain, you will have some that are coming from more nationally minded contexts. So there is some American ones thrown in there. Usually you'll find more some that are championing a certain form of uh, Protestant religion, perhaps Catholic religion, perhaps as well, these aspects. Um, where it tends to be more secular and is the Article One schools, of course. So these tend to be more, yeah. So there is a range in operation. Because it looks like the students were all either Japanese or Japanese, but Japanese kids were like maybe expert kids rather than Japanese Japanese kids who are trying to be global person. So, so historically, I think most of the Japanese nationals who would take an IB education prior to this growth of IB at least would have tended to be so called returnees, kikokchijo, who would usually take IB in another country, come to Japan with those credentials or they would have some education in the other country and then take IB in Japan because of that. Whereas now, because of the growth of the Article One schools, there's a lot of students now who are coming in who have just lived in Japan taking it now. So that has been a big change. 
Excellent. Thank you. We have a question from online from Bill Kelly. Hello. Oh, hello. It says, hi, Akira. Thank you for a very stimulating talk and good to hear about this aspect of your research. There's a long tradition in anthropological research exploring how global forms of culture have been adopted and localized or syncretized in particular cultural contexts. On the basis of your experience research, are there ways in which the adoption implementation of IB in Japan already reflects processes of local adaptation? Or is there a strong expectation, as your presentation seemed to imply, of a adherence to global universal IB standards. Perhaps your research, re research reflects the early stages of a process of working through disjunctures in a process of adaptation. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think very much that my, my, my current stage of research is working with these trajectories because I think they are both existent in what is going on in Japan at the moment. Um, we do have there is, you know, as I was trying to demonstrate with this presentation, there is definitely a, a form of pressure that is being exerted on uh, on IB environments uh, in Japan to to practice global education within a certain certain way. This, I know, from an anthropology context, we often use the theory of globalization by um, Anderson Levitz. Um, uh, and this process of globalization, as she is theorized and her school have theorized, I think is something where we are also seeing a level of this occur, but I think the extent to what level is hard for me to say at this stage, because I've yet to do field work within the schools themselves. What I can say is in the universities, there is a quite a spread of, uh, of success within this form of globalization, depending on the school. But more often than not, at least in my experience with it so far, is that those who tend to mediate mostly in Japanese or entirely in Japanese tend to often be more receptive to um, thinking about what it means to be international within a Japanese context. This also does sometimes levy the risk of them also being more ethno-nationalist sometimes within that context as well. So they do work together. Um, but yes, I think there, and then there's also examples of, of, the, of the other as well. So they are both at work, but to what extent, I think it'll be interesting to see in future work where I hope to work at the schools um, uh, how they are um, being practiced in everyday life on the ground. Excellent. Thank you. There's another question from Barbara. Um, he says, first, I, I apologize for I'm very late, and hence, yes, a clumsy question, which I have a difficult to articulate in a few lines here. On one hand, you have pedagogical programs which embrace egalitarian approaches and interactions, although with a neoliberal slant. On the other, you have implementation practices which are anything but the top-down implementation from a central authority. Are you arguing that it is the latter that we need to worry about so that the former can be adequately critiqued? Thank you, Barbara, for that question. Well, that's a very stimulating question. Um, I think within the context of Japanese society, at the very least, I think it is the latter that we need to be worried about if we are to uh, enable Japanese society to critique um, to critique this. So I think from a Japanese positionality, I would, I would absolutely agree. That is exactly what I'm saying. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Um, we've come to the end of our time here. Please give a big applause to our speaker for a fascinating conversation. And please join us again for our last uh, seminar of the year in two weeks' time on the 11th of December, where we'll hear uh, Abigail McBain from Edinburgh talk about the world on stage, multicultural music and dance at Todaiji's temple's eye-opening ceremony, so the Kaigan Puyo, uh, historical and art historical and multi-sensory um, last talk. Thank you very much.